Yeah, I will start with the threats to biodiversity in the Baltic Sea. And my, my first slide, it's a bit technical, but don't worry about it. You can uh, also look at it with more time later. And it's more to show, so what is this actually? If we talk about the threat, if we talk about the pressure impacts, you will, if you go into environmental science, uh, these are words you will hear. And um, in a way they are connected. So threat and pressure is often used as the same thing. Um, but there is actually a whole framework that is used, for example, in these type of assessments that Daniela was t telling you about, for example, the HOLAS assessment in Helcom or in, in other frameworks, where we try to assess where is the problem coming from, what does it do, and what can we then do to change things. So you've heard um, about the state now from Daniela, and I will try to go more on the pressures. Um, the pressures change the state, but where do actually the pressures come from? So we have we have a whole series of things happening. So at the start, actually, we have social and economic drivers. So we have something that is driving us as humans to want something from the sea, to do something at the sea. We use it for transport, uh, for transporting our goods. We use it for food, for fishing, um, we use it for construction. Um, so there, there is a, a lot of things happening in the sea and that is driven by something that we want or need or think we need, it's not always really needed. And that triggers human activities. And these activities then result into pressures that change the state, as you've heard from Daniela, uh, to a bad state at the moment, and it unfortunately has been like that for many, many years, even decades, uh, which is the work that us NGOs try to do is to, yeah, to show that we really have to change our behavior here now. Um, we then come from the impact that it has on the ecosystem, on ecosystem services, then back to basically what are the consequences? So what do we need to do? Mitigation measures and so on. This is something I will only touch upon very briefly, but you will hear it also in, in several other talks um, in, in these lectures. Um, but basically this, in a way, it should be a cycle. It's often not, uh, which I will show you too, but to see something is happening, we have a bad status, what do we need to do? We need to change something that drives us, we need to change human activities and so on to make the state better. Um, in many cases, it doesn't work yet, but you've, you've seen, for example, the, the nutrient input, what Daniela was showing you, and I'll, I'll show it in a little bit too, goes down. So some, some things are happening, but unfortunately, humans are very slow to react. So what activities and pressures do we find in the Baltic Sea? And basically this picture we could show for most oceans. It's, it's pretty much the same. Some things change a bit in the magnitude, uh, but they are basically all there in those seas that, that are used by humans. On the left in blue, you see um, activities that are done um, at sea. And to the right um, in brown, these are activities that happen on land, but that have an influence on the ocean. And in the middle, the white boxes are what we call the pressures. So what comes from the activities. So if you have fisheries, for example, the, the pressure that comes from it would be overfishing or bycatch so that species are caught that are not supposed to be caught. Um, aquaculture can have um, as a pressure the input of, of nutrients, for example, because the food for the fish is just thrown into the nets and that goes into the ocean. Or it can have invasive species if some species um, escape from the nets, for example, um, and so on. Um, agriculture, for example, that was already shown by Daniela has the big impact of eutrophication. I will go into that a little bit more in a bit. Um, traffic on land. So we have shipping here, the traffic at sea, but also traffic on land can have impact by emissions, for example, that um, go in the air, but then get rained down on the sea. So really basically everything we do, and that's also what we often try to communicate is 
um, not only if I'm at the beach and I'm, I don't know, throwing a piece of litter in the ocean actively, am I doing something that can be bad for the ocean? I can, if I'm deep inland near a river, whatever happens there, this can also affect the, the ocean. So we have a big, um, yeah, a, a very big area that affects the oceans. I would in my talk, I've, I've taken three pressures out that I want to look at it a bit more. Uh, that's the, the input of nutrients, so the eutrophication, um, underwater noise, and uh, also the, the fishing, the overfishing and the, well, I won't say so much on bycatch, that will be more in, in Ida's talk after myself. Um, so you've seen a, a different picture, but basically something similar from Daniela. If you look here, so these are uh, loads of nitrogen. So if we talk about nutrients from agriculture or from emissions, we usually talk about mainly two nutrients. One is nitrogen and one is phosphorus. Uh, this is just sort of as an example to show you. Um, first of all, if you look uh, up here on the numbers, these are dates from 1995 to 2014. And if you look at the tons, it is going down. So that's something also Daniela showed you. This is one of the pressures that has been tackled since the 80s and something is happening, at least slowly. We feel like we have less, but the problem is that the uh, what happened is still in there and it's going to take many decades to really go out. But why I wanted to show you this picture is if you look at the colors to where it comes from and you see all of them have the, the main around 70%, more or less 65 to 70 does come from the rivers. So we have some that come through the air, we have some direct discharge into the ocean, but um, one of the big problems is that um, it is often not seen how the rivers are connected. And our main problem for eutrophication are still the rivers that are bringing the nutrients from the agriculture uh, very deep inland to the ocean. Um, one of the things that happen, and that maybe answers a bit uh, your question, Aditya, that you had on what, how does eutrophication actually work, is that um, by putting nutrients into the ocean, first of all, nutrients is not something that's, that sounds negative to us. I mean, we need nutrients, we need to eat. The, the algae think it's, it's great. There's lots of nitrogen, they eat it. And it's mainly, so the first small organisms that will start growing are uh, so-called phytoplankton. So very small unicellular algae that can grow very fast. So you give them some nutrients and they will just explode. And um, that in itself could still be okay, not a big threat. But the problem is then, first of all, they also shade uh, parts of the ocean. But also then what Daniela was saying exactly, they sink to the bottom. So you have huge amounts of these algae that sink to the bottom of the sea. And uh, you have this big bio dead biomass. And this biomass is being eaten again by bacteria uh, that are anoxic, that create an anoxic environment. So what has been growing in the Baltic Sea are the so-called dead zones. This is the pictures I'm showing you here. We've had dead zones According to science, there have always been dead zones. So it's not something completely just man-made. There are dead zones that are there naturally just because there's not much exchange of water and the oxygen has been used and it's very deep and there's no current. But you see here how they have grown in the last hundred years, more or less. Um, the black parts uh, are where there's really no oxygen at all. The red parts have tiny amounts of oxygen, but these dead zones are really a problem because nothing really can live there besides those bacteria that, that like it when there's no oxygen. So if fish put their eggs, for example, in those areas, they can't develop because there's not enough oxygen and so on. So that is, that is a big problem. And it also happens, this just shows the central Baltic, but it also happens a lot on the coasts where there are a lot of spawning grounds of, of fish that have trouble anyway because they're overfished and then they can't also put their eggs there. So that is one of the, of the big problems of eutrophication is that we get these anoxic zones on the coast and also in the central Baltic. 
Um, the second topic I wanted to show you is underwater noise, and that touches a bit on the topic that um, uh, there was uh, no no points yet on the Miro board. Uh, shipping is one of the maritime sectors. So when we talk about maritime problems, it's often we talk either about shipping, about harbors, about construction work. Um, <clears throat> and here, that's just a snapshot from a website that you see here at the bottom. It's called marinetraffic.com. It's kind of interesting. Uh, you can just go on the website and you see uh, in real life, basically, all the bigger ships that have to have a GPS signal. That, so they have to have a certain type of signal if you're a certain size of ship. So this is not like your small um, local um, recreational boat or something, but it's it's the big ships, the big fish uh, fishermen, but also the big sh fishing vessels, but also the cargo vessels and so on. And so this is in one moment, how many how much traffic there is in the baltic this i took i don't know two days ago maybe uh, i just took a snapshot and so you see how much traffic there is at one time and this is like that constantly whenever you will go on this website it will look like that or similar and ships bring in not only i mean you probably know there's emissions it's the same problem as cars and so on so they they have a lot of problems that we already know of or most people have heard of but they also bring in underwater noise. And that is um, a big problem, especially for species that need to hear, basically. So they, uh, you will hear later from Ida about the harbor purpose. It's a small whale that lives in the Baltic and um, <clears throat> they, they, bas they don't see very well. So they use their hearing, they use echolocation. So they use clicks and how it echoes uh, to orient themselves to find prey and so on. And if it's constantly loud, which it is, so this is here a website, uh, website uh, also where you can um, see basically how much noise is put in, how much continuous underwater noise is put in. And you see that most of the Baltic is basically red. So because no noise also, as you probably all know, it doesn't just stop it. If there's not like a, a big wall that stops it, it will just also spread. So um, noise is a big problem that is not very well tackled yet because it's kind of new, newer. So meaning maybe the last 10 years or so that it's really on the agenda or so. Um, of, of the states to look at it. Uh, whoops, sorry. Um, last uh, pressure I wanted to quickly go into, and Daniela has also shown you a similar picture um, of the herring, um, and you've seen how, how the stocks uh, went down in the last 30 years. And I think, yeah, the, of course, there is the discussion, what is climate change? What is this? What is eutrophication? Maybe what is that? But it's pretty clear that um, if a stock, for example, here in the mid 1990s drops down like that, fishing pressure, which is the right side here, should have dropped down too. And we see that this did not happen until in the, in the 2010s, more or less. So we see that unfortunately, the, the human pressures react too late. So we, we would have needed to react here to actually save the herring stock and we didn't. Still continued fishing and fishing and uh, this is part of the problem. So yeah, the problem is that there are lots of problems and that they, they also accumulate. So it's not just we have this one problem in that area and the other one in that area but they, they accumulate. And what we still don't know is what are actually the cumulative effects. If I have a harbor purpose that is already weak because it's taken on all these hazardous substances that Daniela was telling you about, and it's so loud that it, it can't find its prey. So it's also maybe not starving yet, but it hasn't eaten enough. And then um, we also take its habitat away because we build an offshore wind farm. What happens? And, and these cumulative effects are, oops, sorry, are something that, that are not yet really well known. And Helcom is trying. They've, uh, in their new, in this HOLAS um, assessment that uh, Daniela was telling you about, most of it only comes out 
after the summer, I think, but you can already find, I've put you some websites at the end of this presentation, you can already find some things. And there is one document that looks at this, this cumulative pressure. So <laughs> what are the potential cumulative pressures in the Baltic Sea? And you see here they've tried, so the, the brown is very high. So um, <clears throat> the northern part is, is a bit sort of has a bit less pressures, although if we remember Daniela's part, the climate change problem is actually higher there. And here you see what are the top pressures, hazardous substances, still eutrophication, and then come only physical disturbance and so on, extraction of fish. So this is still something we don't actually know enough about, but it should, what we feel at least, it should make us reduce the pressures because we don't know what they all do, but unfortunately this is not happening. So very quickly, <clears throat> as my, my talk was only on more on threats and pressures and not on the measures, this, this is a completely other talk about what are the measures, but um, what is the problem is that there is a lack of measures. So someone was saying it, I think earlier you were, you were writing it on your Myra board, there's a big lack of political will, unfortunately. It's still something that is not a priority. <clears throat> um, I have... Um, I think it's somewhere here. Where did I put it? Yeah, marine protection is usually sort of an add-on. It's something. Uh, it could. It would be nice if we did a little marine conservation too. But it's not seen that we actually need this. Sorry, <coughs> to drink something. Um, those marine protected areas that we have are often not protected. So we have them on paper, they're drawn there. This is a marine protected area, but there's still a lot of pressures actually happening. So even those areas that should be priority for, um, for nature are often not. The oceans are rather seen as an industrial space. We had a politician in Germany who said in an interview, well, we can build out there, nobody lives there, so it's fine. So, you know, it's like, because we humans aren't out there, it's sort of clear that, that we can use this space. Um, yeah, the destruction is not as apparent as on land. There's this negation of impact of human activities with the example of fisheries, we react far too late. There's often this thing, oh, we need more research before we act and new problems come in before we've actually finished tackling the old ones. Um, what we always say is we really do know enough to act. So um, yeah, we of course we always need more research. Research is very good and we need it, but we also need to start acting otherwise it's gonna be too late. And um, yeah, this was the end of my presentation. If you have questions and I have added a last slide behind this, I'm guessing that you can get the presentations afterwards, Anna, um, yeah. I've added a last slide with just a few links to some of the things that I was saying, if you want to read up more on it. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. My name is Ida Kallian. I work at the Swedish Society for Nature Conservation. Uh, unfortunately, I can't be there with you today, so I'm recording this beforehand. Uh, if you have any questions at all after this presentation, please feel free to get in touch with me and you can you can find my email address and so on on the SSNC website or just ask um, the course leaders about how to get in touch with me. Um, so I'm here to tell you a little bit about the Baltic Sea Harbor purpose and the threats against this population. And I'm going to put uh, quite a bit of emphasis on bycatch because that's one of the main threats to this population. So just starting with telling you a little bit about the porpoise in general, this is a very small whale that lives in the northern hemisphere. Uh, there are several populations. Uh, this, uh, the fact that it's a small whale and lives in cold waters means that it spends a lot of energy trying to stay warm. And that in turn means that it has to eat almost constantly. So it's very dependent on a reliable food source. It eats small fish like cod, herring, and sprat. It finds food uh, and orientates and communicates through echolocation clicks. So as you know, dolphins communicate using whistles, but porpoises only use their clicks to communicate and, 
and sort of see their own underwater world. Um, there are three populations of harbor porpoises in the Baltic Sea region. As you can see here on this map, there is one population in the North Sea, which is quite a large area. There's another uh, population in the Kattegat and Belt Seas, which is the middle blue color in this map. And then we have the Baltic proper harbor porpoise population, which is in the Baltic proper, so the Helcom and CCB area that we usually talk about here. Uh, the harbor porpoise is the only whale which is present year-round in the Baltic Sea and which actually reproduces here regularly. Uh, unfortunately, today there's only a few hundred animals remaining in this population, so it is um, seen as critically endangered. So this map shows the results on distribution of harbor purposes from an EU-funded project called SAMBA, which was carried out in 2011 to 13. So it's quite a while ago now, it's 10 years old. Uh, and you can see that the, this distribution that you see here is the distribution in the winter months, so from November through April. And you see that there is a, an orange area down in the southwest, and this is purposes from the Belt Sea population. But if you can see my marker in south of Gotland, in the middle of the Baltic proper, there is a bit of a lighter area. And this is the most important area for the Baltic harbor porpoise. And this is more clearly seen in the map for summer distribution. So from May through October, the Baltic proper harbor porpoise spends most of its time in this area. So this is where we think that they reproduce and give birth to their calves. Since the SAMBA program, uh, national monitoring programs have been running, but these monitoring programs doesn't give any estimates of abundance and density of the population. That, and that's why SAMBA, what you see here, is still the most recent knowledge about the distribution of the population and also uh, the abundance estimate from Samba, which is around 500 animals. I usually say that there is a few hundred animals left and we're not really sure how many because the confidence interval from this study is quite large. And since this study is now 10 years old, we're really hoping that we will soon see a Samba 2 happen so that we can get new estimates of abundance and, and learn how this population is is doing because we don't really know at the moment. So, as I said, uh, the Baltic proper harbor porpoise is critically endangered, listed as, as critically endangered by the IUCN. Uh, you can see the estimate here of 491 animals, which is obviously very approximate. Um, the female fertility is likely to, to be quite low in this in this population, given that the levels of environmental contaminants in the Baltic is quite high. Uh, and you can see a calculation here that suggests if there is 500 individuals left approximately, about 220 of those were, would be female, given the sex ratio. About 50% of those would be in a re reproductive age, and at least 70% of those are not fertile due to the con contaminant load. And that means we might have less than 100 females in the Baltic, which can actually produce offspring. So this is a very serious situation which needs to be remedied as, as soon as possible. And the potential biological removal was recently calculated to 0.7 animals per year, which means that this population cannot sustain bycatch, for example, of more than one animal per year. So this is quite a serious population, uh, the situation for this population. Uh, moving on to the fisheries in the Baltic Sea, we know that pelagic trawling and small scale Gillnet fisheries are the main fisheries in the Baltic. There are semi-drift nets uh, used in some areas for salmon, for example. Uh, the main fisheries are for herring, sprat, cod, salmon, and flatfish. 
but also other species depending on the area. Um, fisheries are currently decreasing due to the fish stocks crashing, especially the small scale fisheries, unfortunately. And also there is an issue with seal depredation to the nets, uh, which means that some small scale fishermen find it difficult to sustain their, their business. Um, when it comes to both bycatch in the Baltic Sea, we know that it was substantial historically. Uh, for example, there is a study from the 1960s where a scientist collected 50 animals by caught in Swedish salmon um, fisheries in just one year. And that's obviously unheard of today. So that is a sign of how much the population has declined since then. Uh, so the salmon drift nets used to be a big problem for bycatch. Now probably the semi drift nets uh, that are used in some areas are still an issue. Bycatch is also caused by gill nets and trammel nets. Um, so we still have quite a big bycatch problem. And even if it's not visible because the population is so small that it might not there might not be very many animals by caught every year. Any animal by caught in the Baltic Sea is a big threat to the to the population. So policy wise, um, we as NGOs have been working with this issue for quite a while. And on uh, our request, or in 2019, a group of NGOs, including CCB and SSNC and a lot of others, submitted a request to the European Commission to take emergency measures for the Baltic Harbour Corpus. And that led to the Commission asking ISIS for scientific advice on how to mitigate bycatch in the Baltic Sea. And this was published in 2020. And in the same year, an infringement procedure was also started against Sweden for not following the Habitats Directive in relation to harbour porpoise bycatch. Um, this process then led to the regional fisheries organisation Boltfish to discuss and come up with what is called joint recommendations under the CFP. So the Baltic Sea EU member states submitted joint recommendations to the European Commission, which then became a delegated act in February last year. So you can see the map here of what measures that delegated act contains. So this is uh, closures of static net fisheries in quite a few um, Natura 2000 areas for harbour purposes. However, um, to take measures in only the uh, protected areas, isn't enough now we, when we have a population that is in need of it basically completely eliminating bycatch. So we would have, and, and the ISIS advice also states that we would need to mitigate bycatch in the entire population range. And ISIS proposes that this can be done outside of uh, protected areas that this can be done using pingers, which is a little device that you put on fishery, fishing nets that makes a little sound to make the porpoises aware that there is a net in the water and they can avoid it. However, in 2021, military forces in some Baltic countries decided that they cannot allow large scale use of pingers in the Baltic and proper. So at this point, we're at a standstill where we have the first delegated act, which is great, but it's not enough to protect this population sufficiently. Um, so currently, Boltfish is discussing what other measures can be taken, and the Commission is putting pressure on the Baltic states, Baltic Sea member states to, to do more for the Baltic Harbour Corpus, but it's quite unclear at this point what they will do. Uh, they are discussing what they call real-time closures um, of, of static net fisheries in the Baltic, which would basically mean that if a porpoise is sighted or by caught in an area, 
static net fisheries would be closed in this area for a certain time. But it's really unclear and scientists have raised voices to say that this isn't going to be a viable mitigation measure because it is really, really difficult in, in many, many ways uh, to use this measure. Um, so we are still pushing the, uh, the member states to take other measures um, to mitigate bycatch and to basically eliminate bycatch in the Baltic Sea. Uh, Boltfish also recently came out with and sent to the Commission a joint recommendation on control measures to control that the first delegated act is followed. But it, this doesn't have any extra mitigation measures in it, so it, it's not anything new, really. Also in February this year, the European Commission published a long-awaited marine action plan for how fisheries can be uh, regulated to sustain biodiversity in the Baltic and other EU seas. And in this action plan, the Baltic Harbour Purpose is specifically mentioned. So the Commission really recognizes the need to take measures for the Baltic Harbour Purpose. Uh, so going forward, uh, there will be continued discussions in Boltfish, uh, both on the real-time closures and other measures for low-density areas. But so far, we haven't seen any discussions on areas of higher density, which, which would include Polish waters, the Swedish coast, and, and German waters, where we still need to have more, more uh, regulations to mitigate bycatch. And that goes for the entire range of the population. It might be possible that we can have different measures from different, for different areas, but we still really need to do more. And we're still waiting for Boltfish to come with reasonable suggestions on what that could be. And when it comes to the military issue uh, with the military not accepting use of pingers, there will be uh, hopefully this summer trials on pinger use and acoustic sonars um, in Finland, because the problem, what the military says is the problem is that pingers might interfere with their sonars and their ability to detect submarines, for example, underwater. So the idea is to look at how big of a problem that would be in reality and if there is anything that could be done technically to mitigate that problem so that we can use pingers in the Baltic. Uh, there's also a problem in Sweden, for example, where uh, scientists and the national monitoring program isn't allowed to put out porpoise click detectors in the water to continue the national monitoring program or to expand the national monitoring program, which is a big problem in itself. So this is also a, a discussion that needs to continue in, in the Baltic re region. Also, the infringement against Sweden is still active. Uh, the Commission hasn't moved to the second step. So the first step of an infringement is a formal notice. The second step would be a recent opinion, but that hasn't happened yet. So uh, me, for example, and others are supporting the Commission to hopefully take that second step in, in this procedure to make sure that Sweden feels the pressure uh, to do more, because Sweden is, for the Baltic Harbour Purpose, the most important country. In the summer, about 98% of the Harbour Purpose population in the Baltic is in Swedish waters. So Sweden is really the most important country to, to move here. So that's what's going on, and we'll keep work, keeping uh, to work about this, um, and we hope that we will have some more results soon. And that's it for me. Thank you for listening. And as I said, let me know if you have any questions or, or anything. Um, and thank you. I hope you have a good course and I'll see you around. Bye.